Well, good afternoon, Steve. How are you today? Absolutely wonderful on a snowy day. <laughs> snowy day. Well, I can't say it's snowy here in Tampa Bay, but uh, I know you love snow, so enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to um, be um, talking with you today about the School Climate Task Force initiative that you've been involved in for the past few years. Why don't we begin by your telling us uh, a bit about the task force, uh, why and how it got started, and a bit about the report um, it issued, uh, if, if I recall correctly, in January 2017. Certainly. Uh, so uh, from a, a background standpoint, just real briefly, we've got about uh, 14,500 kids in the district, uh, and uh, we're uh, significantly uh, diversifying uh, over the course of the, the past decade. Uh, we have uh, uh, about 40% uh, of our kids are uh, eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Uh, about 45% of our kids uh, are diverse uh, students. Uh, and then uh, uh, we've got about 98 different languages spoken in the district because we're, we have a lot of refugees who've resettled here. Uh, and so that's been a significant change in our district in the last decade, uh, and our board went through a strategic planning process three years ago, and at that time, uh, based on some uh, anecdotal feedback uh, that we were receiving from students, staff, and community members, uh, the board set a goal, and I'm going to read it to you here because it's a long one, uh, but it says that we will annually improve the educational experiences for all children through culturally inclusive and responsive school environments and classroom instruction as measured by various student assessments, including our biennial youth survey, with a focus on equitable outcomes for students in protected classes. And that's a really worthy uh, goal there, and obviously there's a lot packed into it. But yeah, it's worthy uh, and it's ambitious, both. Yes. Uh, and the, the, the upshot is that there was a clear recognition uh, up at the board level uh, that uh, we needed to uh, have a, uh, a clearly defined uh, set of objectives about working with our entire student population uh, and an understanding that making it a pillar in our strategic plan would then force us to set some measurable goals, devote some resources to it, uh, and clearly put some time, energy, and effort into it. So uh, after the board set that goal, uh, the next question we had to ask ourselves was, how will we do this? Uh, it wasn't necessarily inside our wheelhouse uh, when you looked at the staff that I had uh, at the administrative level. And from another contextual standpoint, we are blessed to have the University of Iowa right down the street from us. Uh, and so we reached out to the University of Iowa Public Policy Center. Uh, and through them, we've developed an equity implemented partnership. And we started that conversation back in 2015 with them. Uh, so we find ourselves uh, here four years later uh, knee-deep in the work. Uh, and I know that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's very broad-ranging, um, has uh, lots of impact uh, in multiple areas of our, our district from hiring to professional development to uh, uh, classroom socio-emotional uh, learning components, uh, and, and I know that it's far too much for us to talk about today, uh, but I know that one of the things that, uh, that uh, came out of uh, the work that we did was a clear understanding that uh, we needed to work very closely um, with our teaching staff, uh, not unlike many other areas of the country, uh, as our student body diversified, um, our staff diversification did not keep up with that. Uh, and so our, our teachers don't necessarily look like our children in the classroom. Uh, and so we need, knew that we needed some uh, specific work done uh, with our building administrators and with our teachers uh, to ensure that uh, they were meeting the needs uh, of the students in our classroom if we really, truly were going to achieve that goal uh, and have that culturally inclusive and responsive school environment that was really meeting the needs of every child. So tell us um, a bit about this this school climate task force. How uh, what role 
has this played in in the um, initiative? Absolutely. How did it get started, and who 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 comprised it? So again, I, uh, one of the things that uh, we're also blessed with is a, a very uh, active community. I've I've had the privilege of working in multiple school districts, and every school district has a a different uh, measure of involvement from their community population. Uh, and if you were to look at the continuum from uninvolved to involved, uh, if you went uh, uh, two notches to the right of involved, that would be where our community lies on that uh, continuum. Um, so we have lots and lots of community members, many who don't have children in the district any longer, who are uh, hyper-engaged with the work that we're doing. So. Uh, when we met uh, and started this process with the University of Iowa, one of the things that we knew uh, would be a lever for success for us was to not contain the work uh, within the school district uh, itself. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we recognized was as we looked at the various prongs uh, within the plan that we put together, uh, that, that there would be uh, multiple opportunities for us to involve uh, teachers, support staff, building administrators, and uh, community citizens uh, in that. And so uh, we put together, uh, as we go through this process, we, we will establish task force as uh, they become necessary in order to move segments of the plan forward. Uh, and so one of the first things that we did was put a task force together simply to frame uh, the areas of study that we needed to focus on. Uh, and, and they looked at... Uh, uh, the partnership development and capacity building, so who are we working with both inside and outside of public education. They, we talked about student experiences um, in classroom climate and school climate. We talked about racial equity. Uh, we talked about LGBTQ plus equity. And so as we went through each of those areas of, of focus, uh, we would establish a separate task force then that would help drive the work in that area and ensure that we were not only meeting the student, students' needs, teacher needs, principal needs, but also meeting community expectations. Uh, and the, the really nice part of that process is that those task, force, task forces were able to surface some things that might have been more problematic if they came from inside the district, uh, might have uh, experienced greater pushback if they didn't have the legitimacy of a multi-stakeholder uh, process. Uh, you know, I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, we have uh, been using inclusive restrooms in the district um, for the past uh, three years now, uh, and uh, that has been a very controversial issue all over the United States. Um, I just saw a story in the news last week about it. Um, we've had zero controversy here about it. Uh, we haven't had anyone at a board meeting either in favor or against it. We haven't had kids protesting in favor of it or against it. And I, I truly believe it's because we used a very deliberate process that involved multiple stakeholders before we made any recommendations to the board and before we took any action. So that, uh, uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's the process that we've used around each of these areas of focus inside uh, that partnership and inside our, our uh, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, so as I said, one of the uh, the areas that we focused on was uh, the student experience uh, in both the classroom and the school and understanding that that climate piece uh, is really crucial to student engagement uh, and to student success. Uh, and uh, that task force, uh, as we brought that group together, uh, we had uh, many teachers involved in that along with building administrators, uh, and, and members of our community, and they looked at teacher beliefs, um, teacher behavior, how that impacted students' beliefs and their behavior, and then how that would then, uh, in turn, help to drive uh, student learning and achievement. And one of the things that we quickly came to understand uh, as we went through uh, the outcomes that, that uh, the task force set up was that uh, while we have uh, educators who are firmly committed uh, to this uh, pillar of the strategic plan that the one thing that uh, uh, we seem to find consistently building to building, grade level to grade level, was a uh, capacity issue. Uh, and that was both for our, our staff 
uh, and for our, our building leaders and for our district leaders. So, you know, you look at those types of things and you look at the, the will and the skill that are involved in order to, to get something of this magnitude moving forward, and there clearly was no lack of will. But uh, living in Iowa, where 95% of the adult population is Caucasian, uh, and, and, uh, and again, a student population that looks very different from our adult population, uh, we had a lot of really tough conversations about what we needed to do as adults in order to meet our kids' needs. Uh, and so that engendered for us a major focus on adult professional development with a recognition that if, if we didn't focus on the people that were working with the kids, um, that simply doing things that were focused on, on the students themselves was unlikely to generate the results that the strategic plan called for. So professional development was an area of the, the school climate task force recommended? Yes, they did. You'd be involved in. How many people are on the task force, by the way? Uh, that particular task force had about 30 people on it. Uh, and, yeah, uh, and part of the, the issue is uh, we tend to go through that stakeholder analysis and, and uh, slice and dice uh, segments of the community up and try to get everybody uh, that we can uh, represented on there so that there are no uh, blank spots. Uh, when we look at the voices in the community that have, have had the opportunity to have input on it. Sometimes it makes it a bit unwieldy, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the folks that are facilitating it, just because we've had so many of these task, force, task forces running now, they've gotten pretty good at, at uh, hurting the cats uh, when you wind up with that many folks on the... Who, who on the were your facilitators for the task force? When we looked at professional development, uh, we started looking at the, the culture and climate issue uh, in the classroom and the schools. Uh, one of our assistant superintendents uh, stepped forward and co-chaired that. Uh, and oh, okay. he co-chaired that with uh, one of the uh, people from the University of Iowa Public Policy Center. Uh, so we had the, the internal person who had the, the juice to get things done, and we had the external person who had the resources and the knowledge to help decide what it was that we needed to do. So how often, how many meetings did this um, task force have <laughs> over what period? If you ask Matt, uh, he would probably say too many. Uh, and if you ask <laughs> Sarah, she would probably say not enough. Uh, and those are our internal <laughs> and external co-chairs. Uh, it took them, um, with this particular topic, uh, it took them uh, about uh, uh, four meetings to figure out that we needed the, the adult growth component to it. But then it took them about eight meetings to figure out what we were going to do because some of the things that uh, we knew we needed to tackle are things that uh, carry some baggage with them in terms of expectations for staff. So a couple of the things that we knew that we needed to work on. We needed to work on implicit bias. And implicit bias training can be um, a, a tough hurdle for folks to go through. And we looked at it from a universal standpoint. We wanted every administrator to lead the charge on it. Then we wanted every teacher in the building to go through it. But then we also recognized that support staff have an incredible impact uh, on kids, and so we wanted them to go through it. So we set up a three-year process where they would go through implicit bias training in each building. The next step in the process was what does culturally responsive instruction look like? So again, got to have the building leaders in charge of that. And so we had to bring our principals in and do an incredible amount of work with them because we couldn't expect them to lead that without uh, having the background and the capacity and the confidence that when they were out there uh, asking our teachers to change the way that they teach, uh, that they would be able to do so by, and, and have uh, a fairly good uh, fidelity of implementation. Uh, so those were those are some things that came up as part of that task force. Like I said, they're they're big rocks to move, and so they had, a, had to spend a little extra time working through that, making sure that they had buy-in from everyone on the task force, so that when they made the recommendation, that we could really make sure that it took hold and, and that we were able to implement it across the district. So uh, in the area of professional development, following up on this January, um, let's see, 2017 report of the task force, um, what have been the results up to now, so far as you can tell? What different 
uh, well, one of the has things, it made uh, in the student experience? Yeah, we uh, we subscribe to the Emperor Wears No Clothes uh, philosophy here in the <laughs> district, um, which which is problematic. Uh, we have worked very closely uh, with the UI Public Policy Center to do rigorous data gathering and evaluation, um, and then we publish it all. Um, we share it at board work sessions, uh, and we have uncomfortable conversations. I uh, at the board table, at the work session table, and then I uh, that's followed by a briefer presentation, but on camera at our board meeting, uh, where we're able to share now, uh, we're three years in, so we really have truly longitudinal data where we can start to see trend lines in there. Uh, and we assess uh, uh, whether or not that training that we've done uh, has had an impact uh, on what teachers are doing in the classroom. In, and based on the goal, the experiences that students perceive in the classroom, mm. uh, and okay. and we see we see things that turn out to be green indicators, and we see things that turn out to be red indicators, and then we got some stuff where the needle's just not moving. Uh, and and our staff, uh, we are blessed. We've got some of the best teachers I've ever worked with in my career here. Some of the best administrators, and they've been very candid about where our implicit bias training has worked and hasn't worked what's resonated with them and what hasn't. And so we've been able to modify and adjust as we go through that three-year implementation plan to try to improve it. Uh, Can you give us some examples, concrete examples? Sure, of uh, some of those metrics? Yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, so uh, so we did a uh, – um, I'm going to uh, turn to the uh, um, our student survey uh, because, like I said, one of the things that we do is, is we, we reach out directly to our kids uh, and we talk about uh, a teacher and adult relationship. So that's one of the, the keys when we're looking at that implicit bias training, when we're looking at that culturally responsive uh, instruction, is how are our teachers connecting and bonding with our kids? Because we know that when kids are engaged in school and in content, and when they feel a sense of belonging and connection with adults in the building, they are far more motivated to do well in class. So we know that. The research is crystal clear on that. Uh, and how to bridge the gap when we have some cultural uh, differences in teachers and students is really a big part of that uh, implicit bias training, but then more so in part of that uh, culturally responsive instruction training that we've done. So we ask the kids, uh, for instance, do you think that uh, the teachers treat students fairly? Do they give them the same opportunities in class? Uh, and, and, uh, and then we disaggregate that. Uh, by uh, all of the, the various uh, demographic uh, uh, contexts that we have within our, our student information system. So we can see overall how the kids feel about that in terms of equitable treatment over time, but then more importantly, how do our Caucasian students feel about it? How do our African American students feel about it? What do our uh, uh, Asian uh, American students, our Latinx uh, kids feel about that? And I, uh, for instance, when we look at, we break it down then by areas of support. So I said, some things are good, some things aren't so good. So we can see that uh, in academic support, there it hasn't changed much, but 92% of the kids feel a positive relationship with their teachers. So it's already pretty high. Uh, but then uh, one of the things that uh, came up in one of the first years of the study was, where is student voice in the classroom? And so that's a new question that we asked this year. We hadn't asked it in previous years. Uh, but this year that came in and only 50% of the kids felt that there was a, an adequate student voice in the classroom. So there's an enormous opportunity for us as we look to the future um, to better understand uh, uh, how we can impact uh, uh, kids' experiences in the classroom. I talked about working with our support staff. So one of the things that we ask uh, kids is tell us about your mentor relationships. Do you have a mentor outside of school? Do you have a teacher mentor? Do you have another adult at school who's a mentor? Is it a, a club or an extracurricular person? Uh, and one of the things that we saw go up significantly uh, in the last two years was the number of kids who felt that they had someone beyond a classroom teacher that they considered to be a mentor. And remember I said when we did our, our mm -hmm. uh, professional development, we knew the principals had to lead. And clearly, we know that the teachers have to be an important part of that because we're talking about the classroom experience. But we also put all of our support staff through the training. And so now we're seeing the fruits of that labor 
because they are far more responsive to students in school and they have a greater understanding of their role in supporting the kids. But more importantly, not only do the adults know that, but we're starting to see the kids tell us that they're forming those relationships with those adults, and we can see those numbers going up. So that's a, that was a bright spot in our, our last round of, uh, of survey data that we got back. Great. Now, looking forward, where do you uh, see taking professional development? Uh, so we've done a number of things. Uh, yep. uh, coming out of the um, School Climate Task Force report, uh, where are you going to take that? The next so one of the things, yeah, years. one of the things that uh, that we've been uh, listening to staff about is uh, understanding that uh, this the student experience with the climate has a great deal to do with what our adults in the classroom are doing. But one of the things that's become uh, very apparent as we listen to the teachers and listen to the students as part of this data gathering process is an understanding that uh, our adults uh, in the, uh, the classrooms are not well trained and don't feel uh, that they have adequate preparation to provide socio-emotional support for kids who may bring a lot of adverse childhood experiences into the classroom. So that has surfaced uh, really prominently in our, our last year of data gathering. So as we convene our, our regular meetings with our Equity Implemented Partnership and as we start to dig through the data that came out of that survey, it became really painfully apparent to us that um, our, our teachers and our support staff feel far better able to bridge the cultural gaps uh, that may exist in the classroom. And our kids are starting to tell us that they see the teachers uh, and the support staff bridging those gaps. But now what we're finding is the socio-emotional gaps uh, are, are probably as great or greater uh, than those diversity gaps were. Uh, and I think one of the, the more troubling uh, aspects of our data gathering that came out of the last set of surveys was the number of adults that we have in our system that also have those adverse experiences either in their past or in their current lives. So we've come to understand that that socio-emotional learning component uh, is going to be crucial if we're really going to be able to achieve this equitable learning environment. Uh, and so we're now, uh, we've got a task force that's looking at that. We recognize we're going to have to be all in on PD for that. And again, it's going to have to run the gamut. We're going to have to get our principals up to speed so that they can lead. And then we're going to have to get our teachers uh, trained so that they can provide that support. And, you know, one of the things we hear from teachers is, hey, I'm not a counselor. We understand that. But what is your role to help kids who are struggling? Uh, and then uh, our support staff, because we're about one-to-one. Uh, -one. When you look at our, our uh, overall employment base, we've got about 2,200 uh, employees in the district, about 1,200 are teachers. So about 1,000 of, of our folks are somebody else besides the classroom teacher. Uh, and so what kind of support mechanism can they play uh, with our kids as we're dealing with more and more of these adverse experiences that are brought into the classroom. Well, sir, this has been fascinating, and I I know you uh, have a tremendous uh, busy day. You told me you have another commitment coming up very soon. But let me throw in uh, a question. Um, I know many of our listeners will be interested in how you were able to uh, manage a very diverse task force of, uh, you said, around 30 people uh, that had to be a, a really tremendous challenge. Uh, what would you identify as the key success factors? Uh, 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 what made it possible to uh, turn that uh, school climate task force into a really productive body in terms of coming up with its uh, recommendations? We have, uh, and I'll tell you that uh, it looks great today, but if you would have uh, asked me these same questions four or five years ago, uh, I would have had to stumble around with an answer because uh, at that point in time, uh, we struggled like crazy for efficacy in these types of groups. 
I, I used to describe it as they tended to wander around in the wilderness, and we hope to goodness that when they came out, they actually brought something productive with them. Uh, we now have a really tight rubric um, that we ask uh, uh, them to work within, and it, it starts literally at the beginning. We have a rubric for how we select people uh, to be on the committee, so it's not simply this random collection of people that come together. They may be crusaders for a cause, or they may overrepresent one segment of the community. So. Uh, we start with a very deliberate membership process, and then so you um, carefully say, craft the composition. Oh, absolutely, you know, I, I kind of liken it to the you know one tall and one short, and and uh, <laughs> one male and one female, and one of this and one of that, and and uh, they literally have a grid that they have to go through to try to uh, uh, to make sure that they we haven't left uh, any any corner of the community uncovered, and then then they have a really rigorous rubric that they follow that keeps them on task, uh, keeps them focused, doesn't let them wander into other areas because there are, you, this, it, when you're talking equity, uh, there are lots of different areas that you could focus in on. Uh, and so we use a rubric to keep them uh, really tightly on task. And then I'll tell you that having the University of Iowa folks involved uh, as um, uh, neutral third parties uh, is uh, a wonderful resource, and I would recommend that to anybody doing this kind of work, is if you can get somebody who's not uh, emotionally invested in the work that you're doing but has the intellectual knowledge and expertise to inform the work that you're doing, uh, they can say things that might not otherwise be said in those meetings. They can real people in who kind of wandered away. Uh, they can they can delineate things that you're not going to work on and things that you are going to work on. Uh, so without them at the table, uh, we might still be struggling a little bit, uh, but they've been an a, a outstanding objective third-party facilitator for us. So strong facilitation, carefully crafted composition, uh, clear guidelines for uh, uh, to follow uh, anything else. Yeah, the last one would be tight, tight timelines. Uh, we give them uh, uh, expected data completion for the work that they're doing, uh, and we're always hyper-aggressive for when we expect that to be done. Uh, and uh, we rarely deviate in terms of giving them uh, an extension. Uh, and so now that we're a few task forces in, uh, those who serve understand that um, you're going to commit to doing something. It's going to be a short-term commitment. It's going to be a high-energy, high-expectation commitment. Um, but when it's done, we're going to release you. It's not a life sentence. You don't have to be on the task force forever. But while you're on it, we expect you to give it 110%. Great. Well, Steve, I really appreciate you taking the time to – Tell us a bit about um, uh, innovation on the equity front in the Iowa City Schools. This has been fascinating. We'll have to do a part two a few months down the road. Um, that sounds good. When you've got more progress to report. But meanwhile, thanks a lot and, and have a great afternoon.